This episode of HD Nation is made possible by GoDaddy. It's time to get our HD Nation on. Matt in LA is looking for a bigger HD TV. He says, I'm thinking about upgrading my 42 inch Westinghouse 1080p LCD to a 50 inch LG 720p plasma. It sells for 600 bucks. I'm looking for the most bang for the buck. What do you think? Well, I notice a difference in size, resolution, color, reflection. Windows and excess light are not a problem for me. Lastly, does a 24p real cinema functionality make a noticeable difference? I can't stand the 120 hertz motion stuff. I feel your pain. Does your TV and Blu-ray player have to be set to 24p? Does the 24p real cinema work with the Apple TV? Thanks, Matt in LA. Uh, let's take it from the top. Uh, I'd say you're considering a larger screen size with fewer pixels over what you currently have. I really, it's hard for me to recommend that upgrade path, really. I'd say go 1080p or save your money until you can afford at least a 1080p screen because you're increasing that screen size without right. increasing the effective resolution. You're basically going to create a softer picture. Yeah, if you're like, I own a bar, there's a television above the bar, 40 feet away from anybody, 20 yeah. feet away from anybody, yeah, 720p is fine. If you're in the living room and you're like less than 12 feet away from your HDTV, you will, you will feel pain going yeah. from 1080p to 720p. And maybe, I, I've been checking plasma prices lately, and maybe it'll cost you another $100. So it's, there's no, uh, I will never recommend a 720p plasma at this point in my time. Also keep in mind that compared to your LCD, mm -hmm. you're going to be consuming more electricity, especially if you try to drive that panel in any kind of bright mode, like vivid right. or so. So be careful about that. So 24 frames per second versus the 120 hertz, I can make anything look like a cheap wedding video from 1980. And do I have to set my Blu-ray player to 24 frames per second? Uh, you do, if you're going to have support for 24p, you have to be able to put in a 24 hertz signal into mm -hmm. this TV, which most Blu-ray players nowadays will do. So yes, you have to configure the Blu-ray player to do that. Right. And it will switch back automatically to 60 hertz output with the content that's not 24p native. Right. So that's good. Also with the TV, yes, I feel that 24p mode is a good thing. That will prevent that smoothing mode when you enable the 24p mode on the TV <laughs> compared to say the 120 hertz right. mode with a if it's left by default, it will add those interpolated frames, which creates that smoothing effect, which most people despise, including, including myself. It really makes film not look like film. Right. Even though technically it may be a superior way of displaying film, it's just very disconcerting, not because it's not accurate. But oh, it is accurate. Well, it's not accurate compared to a... You it's know, taking the look away from it. Yeah. It's a look. It's a, yeah. You know what? I hate. Uh, yeah, I hate the smooth stuff. I, I dig it, and especially on plasma. So just make sure that you've got the player, the player set up to output 24p, mm -hmm. and then the TV. Once that, once it's receiving that signal, it'll give you that option then to enable or disable that mode. And take a look at it both ways. That particular function, that 24p mode in most TVs, it's getting better over time. So I've noticed that the latest TVs do it a lot better than even a couple years ago. It's also it's, it's not unusual for the sort of the newer the Blu-ray, the newer the Blu-ray player is, the more likely the Blu-ray player will automatically automatically, if you, you let it auto decide the output format, it'll automatically do 24p for movies and, you know, the regular 1080p, 60 hertz, totally. and everything else. Hey, this week I came across a fascinating article about human vision, color vision really, and why traditional color wheels that we use in selecting colors or just looking at how colors blend are considered wrong. Now, I saw this on a uh, website called blog.asmartbear.com slash colorwheels.html. Now, the article's gist was really describing the differences of mixing colors when it comes to light versus pigments, like inks right. and dyes. Well, it's kind of funny because it starts out like, everybody learns in art class, red, assuming you still have art class, red, yellow, and blue. These are the primary colors. Red, and green, and blue. Red, green, and blue? Yeah. Well, uh, at least for for the primary colors, See, for we've additive already, color. We've already sort of gotten to the gist of the article point, which is that there are a lot of different ways to define color, and most of us learn the wrong way, and there's a difference between pigment colors, which are stuff you mix on a paper, versus light colors, which is like looking at a television or a totally. projector. Totally. And then and the crux of it really is that with, with light, it's an additive process, where say you have a red a flashlight that puts out red and a flashlight that puts out blue. If you cross those beams, you'll get magenta or purplish right. color right in the middle. And the same with like a yellow light or a red light and a green light, you get like a yellow mm -hmm. where those two overlap. But with print, it's different. It's actually a subtractive system that takes those second, what are considered secondary colors, your, your red or your yellow magenta and cyan, 
and will basically blend those instead to basically absorb the wavelengths you want, like, and then only reflect the light you're trying to achieve. It's, it's a totally different process. So if you ever open up your, your ink printer, your inkjet printer, right. you'll usually see... CMYK. Yeah, uh, basically, the, the, the secondary colors plus a black channel because that's the one thing you really can't do well with most like inkjet systems right. is create black. It comes down to also, once you get over that, that additive versus subtractive color systems and the difference between print and displays or light technology, it's also the brain's own color filters and how that ties into the concept of color opposites. Namely, that red and green are considered what are called color opposites, and blue and yellow are considered color opposites. They don't really mix. Mm -hmm. If you have, say, red on the screen at 100% and you add 25% green to it, you don't suddenly get a reddish green. You actually subtract out 25% of that red instead of it appearing at 100%. You get a duller red. Yeah. So, no, so, uh, a less bright red. Exactly. And that is really kind of interesting. It has to do with basically a pre-processing system in the human brain that says, you know what, when I'm receiving of this particular wavelength and this particular wavelength, here's how these two are going to interact based on the filters of the brain and how we end up perceiving it. Hmm. And this whole thing about the color opposites determines how it is that we actually perceive the color magenta. Because if you look at a spectral graph and see where magenta lies, it's like, or, or a spectrum of, of all visible color, you'll notice that magenta is not on there anywhere. It's one of those colors that's totally made up in your brain and how that occurs. And this article just really kind of put it together. And in a sense, it got me considering, is, is yellow really truly the fourth primary color? And what does that say about Sharp's Quatron technology too and adding that fourth colored pixel? It, it really got me thinking and it was a really well done article in terms of maybe we should have a color wheel with four primaries, having blue and yellow at opposites mm -hmm. and red and green at opposites and then the blending around that way. And it, it kind of makes sense on a lot of levels. And I just recommend you take a look at it. It, it was just utterly fascinating to me. And if you're, a, if you're a display and or print geek, I think you get something out of it. And off to the new Blu-ray releases. Let's do it. Hey, it's now time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of February 8, 2011. First up, it's kind of a funny story. An adaptation of Ned Vizzini's novel of the same name, It's Kind of a Funny Story, follows Craig Gilner, a suicidal 16-year-old who checks himself into a mental hospital. During his stay, Craig meets a diverse set of characters, including his inpatient mentor, Bobby, played by the funny man, Zach Galifianakis. As with most Blu-ray releases of recent films, the transfer is of high quality, with the feature having plenty of room thanks to the 50 gigabyte disc. So expect clean 1080p VC1 video and clear DTS HD master audio. The extras are average, with commentary tracks, deleted scenes, outtakes, a making of mini documentary, and trailers rounding out this single disc package. Next up, Thelma and Louise, the 20th anniversary edition. This 1991 film was directed by Ridley Scott and stars Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis and features Brad Pitt in his first major film role. It tells the story of two best friends who embark on a vacation that quickly turns into something more dramatic and ends with an iconic ending scene that has been referenced and recreated many times over. Shipping on a single Blu-ray disc, the film sports a 1080p transfer of the original 239 to 1 feature. Extras include deleted and extended scenes, including an extended ending which includes commentary by the director. You'll also get documentaries and featurettes, a music video by Glenn Frey, and multi-angled storyboards of that final chase scene. Also released this week, Uncle Buck. This is one of John Hughes' 80s classics, this time with John Candy in the title role as a bachelor uncle who steps in to babysit his nieces and nephews, including Macaulay Culkin, and of course, hilarity ensues. The picture is a 1080p transfer of the original 185 to 1 feature, and the sound will be encoded in DTS HD Master Audio. Unfortunately, extras on this single disc offering are sparse, listing only production notes and quote, cast and filmmakers. But in exchange, this release is very affordable with an MSRP of $14.99 and Amazon listing it for only $10.99. Other releases include Criterion Collection's Amarcord, Barbed Wire, Beauty in the Briefcase, Discover Planet Ocean, 1987's Five Corners, 1996's Flipper, For Colored Girls, 1978's I Spit on Your Grave, 2010's I Spit on Your Grave, Legends of the Fall, Life as We Know It, as both a single disc or a DVD digital copy combo, 2009's Middlemen, 2010's My Soul to Take, Ocean Odyssey, The Blue Realm, Ongbok 3, either on its own or as a digital copy combo, Paranormal Activity 2, 1984's A Private Function, Repo Chick, the River Wild, The Criterion Collection's Still Walking, Tamara Drew, Waist Deep, Wild Target, and You Again. 
Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoDaddy. GoDaddy.com makes it easy to customize your own virtual dedicated server. Choose one of three popular plans or select your own Linux or Windows servers with all the plan options you need. And remember, you can download GoDaddy's free iPhone, Android, or Blackberry app to order right from your phone, manage your current domains, and more. Want a discount? Just use the code TECH9 to get $5 off, $30 or more. And be sure to check out revision3.com slash GoDaddy for a list of all the amazing GoDaddy deals from Revision 3.